So we're going to be looking today at three dresses covering 100 years of fashionable women's wear in Britain and France. We're going to start in the 1830s and then move all the way to the 1930s. Looking at all sorts of topics from silhouette to textiles to developments in the whole fashion industry. So this is a Victorian dress and it can be specifically linked back to Gloucestershire in England and we can date it to around 1835 to 1840. So this is a really typical characteristic dress of this period of Victorian fashion. It's got the brown colour palette, the use of the printed cotton, the silhouette elements so typical such as the puffed sleeve and the slightly off the shoulder neckline. If we go back more to the Regency era, the bust line was very much straight under the bust and it's sort of moved down a little lower by the 1830s. Dresses from this era, the fullness was created through gathers at the top here that kind of forms natural pleats almost in the skirt. So this kind of skirt would have been held out by numerous petticoats. Later, more like mid-century, the skirts got even wider and that was through the invention of the crinoline, which was a sprung steel structure which enabled you to hold out your skirts and not have the weight of lots of petticoats. And on the subject of underwear, there would have often been the sleeve puffs worn under these shapes on the sleeve to hold that volume in place. So this dress was hand-sewn, most likely by a professional dressmaker. You would often expect hooks from dresses of this period, but there are no fastenings that we're aware of. So most likely the wearer would have been pinned or sewn into the garment. So if we come to take a look at the bottom of the sleeve towards the cuff, we can take a look under this puff and we'll have revealed some of the smocking like we have at the top of the sleeve, almost entirely hidden by the puff element, but that allows for this small cuff to be made at the bottom. We've got these tucks running down the centre front of the bodice, mirrored on each side, creating a V shape, really intricately done. Areas like this suggest that the printing was done in more than one stage. There's a gap perhaps left for the motif, that's where the white's showing, and then a slight mismatch in the two processes when the motif is added. So these teardrop-like motifs are often referred to in the UK as paisley. They are really inspired by Indian Bhutto motifs, which is a term used to describe single standing flower or floral sprig motifs. And this really came into the European design idiom, often along colonial lines through Kashmir shawls being imported often through the East India Company. And then designers in Europe would be sort of imitate elements of those objects. And the reason this came to be known as Paisley is because Paisley, which is a town in Scotland, became one of the main manufacturers making imitation cashmere shawls. But these motifs crop up really through most of the century and in various different contexts. As you can see here, in combination with very different design elements, we have these trailing floral sprigs, the speckled brown ground. And actually inside the Paisley motifs, there's some really interesting, almost you could say geometric looking elements that often might be thought to be a more kind of modern look. So that's a nice detail. This is a printed cotton. There was a huge demand for printed cottons at this time, both for fashion and furnishings. It is a fabric that we now are very aware has a problematic history to it. So actually the vast majority of the world's cotton around this time had a direct connection with enslaved labor in the US where this fiber was being cultivated and processed. A lovely object, but with some very difficult histories attached to it. We actually know quite a lot about this dress because it stayed within one family who then donated it to the V&A. So we have quite a lot of provenance on it. And it was actually originally worn as a wedding dress to a country wedding in Gloucestershire in England. And it may not sort of be a stereotypical Victorian wedding dress where people might often think of a white gown, but that um, was a trend actually only coming in around this time and heightened when Queen Victoria got married in 1840 wearing white. And then even after that point, people would often still get married in colors other than white, perhaps more practical colors. Particularly if you didn't have so much disposable income, you would be looking for a practical dress you could use on multiple occasions. We are told in the provenance history that this dress was worn for the wedding and then it was kept in a box and then came to the V&A 100 years or so after it was worn. 
It was donated by Mrs. Catherine Rose. And then I think we're, um, we've probably had it nearly 100 years now at the V&A, so we're getting a nice life cycle here. So we're going now to look at the second dress, which is from England again, moving from the 1830s to around 1910, also known as the Edwardian era. Of course, we've had about 70 years between these garments and a lot changed in between. It certainly wasn't from this look to this. And it is also worth saying that fashion was changing really rapidly in this period. We're in the Industrial Revolution era. Technology is advancing the whole time. Print media is becoming um, a big phenomenon. So we can, we can spread new fashions. We can make um, garments quickly. So it was a time of really quickly evolving styles. So the silhouette for this period was defined by certain characteristics, including for day wear anyway, which this dress is an example of, this high neckline, the fullness around the bust area, the S-bend shape, and this straighter skirt pulls out towards the floor. This really sort of romantic, frothy look often topped off with a very large hat. If you're in fashionable society, everyone was wandering around wearing just this kind of thing, particularly you can imagine on a beach promenade or shopping in a fashionable high street. So something really typical of this era is the very specific silhouette and body shape that it creates, which is often referred to in fashion history as the S-bend, because the chest is thrust forward and the hips back, creating a sort of sinuous shape. And that would have been achieved at the time, partly through posture and also very much through undergarments that sculpted your body in particular ways. So this piece has been put together in a kit-like fashion. And this is again, very typical of this period and very labor intensive to make because of how many panels have to be all attached together. This one piece alone shows many different laces. People could buy the lace and then piece it together in their own ways. And it came in lots of different styles and patterns and motifs. For example, here we definitely have some floral motifs. We have some more abstract shapes. Also has some spot features and down here some tucks. And that's been combined with panels of machine made lace, which has also been embroidered uh, and various trimming elements. So really elaborate construction of a range of different panels. So there are various elements that really show the hand of the maker, that we're not in a sort of perfect mass-produced world for fashionable women's wear at this stage. A clear example, I think, is this area here where you would expect this to be symmetrical down the middle of the back, but the panels of the cotton lawn are really quite different shapes on either side of that lace detail. If we look under the flap of lace here, we're not entirely sure what's going on here with the structure and it's making us wonder if the garment was perhaps altered at some point after the original construction. Perhaps um, it didn't originally fit as intended. Down the sleeve we have lots of details and it ends in these frills here and that just really adds to the sense of throffiness and flounce that was just so popular in this era. A real sense of lightness to this cuff. This piece was originally worn by Viscountess Gladstone and she was the wife of the first Governor General of the Union of South Africa, which was a colonial role. So another object with a difficult history attached to it. It was actually donated by the wearer, I believe in the 1930s, so a couple of decades after it was worn. Inevitably, with a garment of this kind, um, there are little pulls and holes and sometimes they are created by the hooks themselves perhaps also by the wearer's jewellery, perhaps they embrace someone who has a watch and it catches. It's a miracle that we have good examples left because they are extremely fragile and prone to being caught and torn. So for dress number three, we've moved from very early in the 20th century to the 1930s. Again, lots has happened in between these two dresses, style-wise and socially. Fashion-wise, something we're missing here with this timeline is that very characteristic 20s silhouette, which was straighter sides down the body and then a much shorter hemline to around knee length. As we come into the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th, we have the rise of the big name designers, the sort of brand names. And this is an example of that phenomenon. This piece is by a designer called Charles James. He is British North American and had a very international career. Unlike the other two garments, in some ways this dress isn't so clearly typical of its era. 
more common around the 1930s in Britain and France would have been slinky bias cut dresses. Bias cut means you're cutting the textile on the diagonal, so rather than wanting to hang down flat, it wants to kind of mold with the body, move with the body, so it's a more clinging look than we have here. Madeleine Viennet in France was one of the key designers of that look. Charles James actually is known for having worked in lots of different styles. So he did make these typical 1930s, more clinging silhouettes. He also made very avant-garde designs. We have lots of examples in the v and collection, including the clover dress, which is a bold design statement. And then he also is known for referencing the past. And that's what is going on with this dress here. It's actually called Le Sylphide, which is the name of a French ballet from the 19th century. And that sets the tone for all the references we have going on here. It's definitely very influenced by the 19th century. So this waistband here is a very specific reference to the 19th century. It is very similar to a form of 1860s corsetry worn under the bust, as in this instance. But in the Victorian period, it would have been worn underneath the dress. Here we have, in a sense, underwear as outerwear. And if we go around to the back of the waistband, we see that the referencing to 19th century underwear continues in that the waistband is laced down the back and terminates in a bow. This skirt is one of the many historical references on the dress. It actually compares quite closely with this 1830s skirt in the sense of how full it is, but also the technique used. So again, we have this gathering of fabric at the top, which then forms natural hanging down pleats. But there are also some more unusual features here, some more modern touches, which is perhaps James's more avant-garde side coming out. So we've noticed during the mounting process, these hems, which sort of point outwards along the sides, that's quite unusual. And as well, the way it falls at the bottom is actually, in a sense, a high-low skirt because the sides are definitely shorter than the front and the back. We have a very sweeping neckline at the front created by these folds of fabric, which then go up to form um, cap sleeves in a sense. And below that, we have what you could call a faux bodice um, that looks like it's a separate part, but is actually integrally connected to the yellow aspect of the dress. And that has this halter neck feature. And then nestled between those two elements is this large sprig of artificial flowers, which is actually really quite heavy. So it's fortunate that it hasn't caused too much damage to the dress over the years. And then in terms of materials, mainly silk has been used for this piece, which does have a very long history. We think some early forms of plastic may have been used in the internal structure for these flowers. The actual buds themselves seem to have been made from a plain weave cotton. The other two dresses were day wear looks, but this is an example of evening wear. One indication of that is that there's more skin on show at the top, and this lower back is maybe more characteristic of the 20th century. So this particular dress was, we believe, worn by the British artist Marit Guinness Ashan, and she was really a long-term supporter of Charles James, so it's nice to have a piece that connects those two figures. So with these three dresses, we've covered 100 years of fashionable women's wear from Britain and France. I think these dresses really emphasise, obviously, that fashions change over time, silhouettes change, taste in textiles change, but very often um, that change is a reference in many ways to the past, often with a little twist on it. But then after this dress, things would um, change even more because we do start to get more radical developments such as trousers for women, which were very niche um, earlier on. But uh, I think that's for another day. Thank you.